everybody. Uh, I am Tudor Dumitras. Um, I am uh, an assistant professor at the Univers University of College Park, uh, University of Maryland College Park. Um, I work on data-driven security. Um, and uh, today um, I will tell you um, how to build a system that can uh, detect malware that can learn to detect malware uh, by reading and understanding the security literature. So let me share my slides. So um, like I said, I work on data-driven security, which means that uh, in my research group, uh, we uh, use a lot of machine learning techniques to uh, solve security problems. Um, and that's because um, a lot of security problems involve detecting, distinguishing between uh, malicious uh, and benign entities uh, uh, or uh, or examples. Uh, and this is a good uh, this is a good uh, uh, problem setting for for machine learning. So uh, machine learning uh, starts with a few known benign and known malicious examples. Um, and then tries to classify the remaining instances uh, according to how similar they are to these known examples. So machine learning techniques are used extensively uh, both uh, in academic projects and uh, in the security industry. Uh, for example, they are used for detecting spam, phishing, uh, malware, network attacks, for predicting which domains are going to become uh, malicious uh, in the near future, which vulnerabilities are going to be exploited, and probably many other uh, problems as well. Um, so, uh, and in all these problems, uh, the key question is, what does it mean for two instances to be similar? Okay, and to make this clear, um, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, so, let's say that we wanted to detect a spam. Right. So then, um, if uh, if we wanted to use machine learning for this problem, we could compare uh, emails by extracting keywords from the content of the email or features from the email header, uh, such as uh, whether the email came from um, a spoofed IP address. Um, nowadays, uh, we hear a lot about uh, AI bots uh, on social media, so. Uh, and these can be difficult to distinguish from, from regular users. So again, if we uh, say wanted to build an artificial intelligence that would uh, detect these uh, AI bots, then uh, let's, um, we, we could use machine learning and then we could compare their vocabulary, uh, again, the words that they use, or for the more advanced bots, we could try to uh, break down their sentence structure and look at the, uh, uh, at the grammatical properties of those, uh, those sentences to see if they resemble human speech. Uh, so these are all examples of, of feature engineering, uh, determining which features would be uh, useful for uh, distinguishing between the malicious and the, uh, the benign uh, examples. Uh, and these uh, are, are done usually uh, based uh, on, um, um, on a lot of uh, domain knowledge. And uh, to explain why this is uh, key to the success of machine learning, um, let's take a look at the third example. And I will use this example as the running example in this uh, presentation. Uh, and this is uh, detecting uh, Android malware. So now Android malware is a relatively new phenomenon, at least compared to the more traditional malware that we uh, see on, on desktop platforms. Uh, and it has some unique behaviors, such as, for example, because uh, the samples have access to uh, telephony functionality, uh, sending um, uh, SMS fraud uh, is, uh, is a common behavior. Um, so the uh, initial, uh, the early um, Android malware detectors uh, compared samples based on the permissions they requested. And this worked for a while because uh, in, order to, um, in order to do certain malicious operations, uh, certain permissions were, uh, were really uh, uh, critical for, for that functionality. Uh, however, um, the permission itself does not only reflect the privilege of the application and not actually the behavior uh, of, of an application. 
And moreover, if the application includes a uh, privilege escalation exploit, then it does not actually uh, have to uh, request permissions. Uh, so then, um, as Android malware evolved, this uh, early um, um, malware detectors for Android became less and less uh, effective. Uh, so then, uh, the next generation of Android malware detectors uh, started looking at the behavior of the malware uh, rather than the, the permissions. Uh, and this uh, illustrates uh, this point that I'm trying to make that feature engineering uh, is uh, is really, when, when engineering features, it's really important to uh, take into account the, the, the knowledge uh, of the security domain. Uh, and in particular, you must consider what are the semantics of the threat that you are uh, trying to detect. Uh, and um, we have, um, a lot of uh, good information about security today. Uh, uh, many, many uh, academic papers, industry reports, blogs uh, from leading um, uh, malware analysts and researchers. Uh, in fact, there's so much information that uh, it is becoming difficult to assimilate all of it. So, if you if you run a Google Scholar search uh, for uh, for malware, you you see that uh, over 100,000 papers have been published on this topic. Uh, and then if you search for intrusion detection, then uh, there's more than 600,000 papers. Uh, and because uh, of this, uh, of this uh, volume of information, it is difficult for, uh, for security professionals to assimilate all the relevant knowledge that can help them during the uh, feature engineering uh, process. So here's the dilemma. Uh, on the one hand, we have this growing body of knowledge uh, which makes it difficult to um, uh, to engineer good features. Uh, but on the other hand, we need good features in order to keep up with the uh, uh, sort of evolving uh, malware behaviors. So in this project, we uh, asked if we could turn this volume of information to our advantage, um, uh, whether we could engineer these features automatically by mining uh, security papers. So in other words, uh, we would like here to create an artificial intelligence that not only uh, learns from examples, but is also able to uh, help us build other intelligent systems. Uh, and <clears throat> in order to do that, uh, we need to understand how security threats are described in natural language. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, this sentence here is uh, um, is a quote from um, one of the first papers on Android malware, and it says the Zone malware is designed to send SMS messages to certain premium numbers. Um, now, um, a, uh, a security analyst reading this sentence would conclude that um, this actually talks about SMS fraud because the malware is contacting these premium numbers. However, note that uh, this is not based uh, on any linguistic clues. Uh, it is simply uh, based on the analyst's uh, common sense and understanding of how uh, SMS fraud is conducted. Let's take a look at the second example. Uh, this uh, says, um, Ginger Master is often bundled with benign applications and tries to gain root access. So again, uh, a security analyst would uh, conclude that um, and attempts to gain root access are um, um, are a form of privilege escalation, and bundling with benign applications is done for, uh, for evasion purposes. But again, uh, this is not based on on purely linguistic clues from uh, from the sentence itself. So this is the challenge. Uh, in order to uh, understand uh, what uh, these uh, uh, these sentences are saying. Uh, we need to understand the meaning of the words that uh, the papers use uh, to describe security threats. So the Greek uh, philosopher Plato uh, explained this with an allegory of a cave where a group of prisoners are chained so that they face a wall their entire lives. Uh, and on this wall, they observe shadows uh, of objects from the real world, but this is the only way that they experience these objects. Um, and now imagine that one of these uh, prisoners were to leave uh, the cave, experience the, uh, the real world, and then come back to tell 
his fellow prisoners about it, uh, chances are that no matter what words he would use to describe the three-dimensional world, uh, he would not be able to com communicate uh, uh, with the other prisoners because they would lack a shared understanding uh, of what these words mean. So a computer program is a little bit uh, like uh, the prisoners from Plato's Caves, uh, as uh, the words uh, used in the security papers may have multiple meanings, uh, and uh, we must make sure that uh, the computer speaks the same language uh, as the people writing those papers. So this is the first challenge uh, for this project. Uh, this is, in fact, a broader challenge in natural language processing um, and known as the common sense reasoning problem. Um, however, uh, in uh, and so understanding the semantic meaning of, of the words used to describe security threats. Uh, however, uh, there is a second challenge here, which is specific to the security domain. Uh, and I will illustrate this with this chart uh, of the unique words uh, from the uh, papers published in the uh, IEEE Security and Privacy Symposium, which is a flagship research conference in security. Um, so the x-axis is, uh, is time, so uh, the years. Um, and then uh, on the y-axis, I'm showing the cumulative uh, count of unique words. So this is, uh, so, uh, you know, this is a growing curve. So it turns out that this curve uh, grows at a constant rate which means that each year, a constant number of new terms uh, is included in these papers published um, in, um, in the IEEE Security and Privacy Symposium. Uh, and that's a constant number of new terms uh, that um, our, our system must understand. Um, and this is likely a result of the security arms race um, as we develop defenses the attackers um, you know, will try to bypass them, and then they will uh, they will introduce new behaviors in the malware, uh, which will lead to uh, new detection techniques and new defenses. And then uh, this uh, this drives this, this uh, increase in in the in um, in the volume of technical terms that uh, we need to uh, that we need to understand. Uh, but this also means that uh, we cannot rely on uh, natural language processing techniques that uh, match the terms used in the language um, against a fixed um, ontology or a fixed uh, uh, organization uh, categorization of the concepts um, in, in a particular discipline. Uh, and instead, we must discover open-ended uh, behaviors, malware behaviors. Um, and to give you an intuition for how we might be able to do that, uh, let's take another look uh, at how uh, the feature engineering process is described uh, in these research papers. Typically, these papers will have uh, a, a section that um, uh, explains uh, why they selected certain features. So, for example, they might say, we look, um, so the, the features I'm showing on this slide correspond to um, Android API calls. Um, so uh, these papers might say, for example, that we use the get device ID and get sus subscriber ID uh, API calls as features uh, because these calls uh, allow an app to access sensitive data. Uh, we use exact HTTP request and set Wi-Fi enabled uh, because they allow an app to communicate over the network and runtime.exec. Uh, because it allows the app to execute external commands. Um, <clears throat> so um, these descriptions of, uh, of uh, what the feature does, um, we call them malware behaviors. So this is the way the analysts themselves um, uh, explain the purpose uh, of, the, of the feature and, and its relevance and, and the link to, to, to malware detection. Um, and uh, it seems that in order to determine which feature is useful for detecting malware, uh, we need to be able to, uh, to, to link it to, uh, to these malware behaviors. So for the purposes of this work, uh, a behavior is a short description of malware activity um, defined as a, as a short phrase uh, composed of a subject, verb, and object, where either the subject or the object may be uh, may be missing. Uh, and we 
uh, extract these behaviors in an open-ended fashion uh, by parsing the grammatical structure of sentences. Uh, we use uh, an, a natural language processing technique a tool called um, a, a type dependency parser, uh, which uh, uh, provides uh, directed links, establishes directed links uh, between words, uh, and these links uh, reflect the grammatical um, uh, dependencies between uh, between these uh, uh, these words. And by looking at the types of these dependencies, uh, we extract our subject verb object uh, pattern. So, for example, from this sentence, again, I'm I'm showing the example of the of the Z zone, uh, the sentence that talks about Z zone, uh, uh, the Z zone malware. Um, so the first behavior that we extract here is Zone malware send SMS messages. Uh, and then uh, from this sentence, we also extract three other, two other um, uh, malware, um, uh, two other uh, malware behaviors. Um, so uh, what this allows us to do is to break down a long sentence into shorter uh, descriptions of behaviors uh, which have a single meaning. So now we have, uh, we are able to extract these in an open-ended fashion, but we still don't know what they mean. Uh, so in order to determine if these are useful in some way for detecting malware, we link them to concrete features. A and uh, we do this um, by looking uh, at the sentences and whenever we uh, uh, discover one behavior such as access uh, sensitive data, um, next to a uh, concrete feature, uh, in this case, the get device ID API call from Android, uh, then we, uh, uh, we establish a link between them and we consider that the, uh, uh, the, the, the feature is, is relevant for this particular uh, behavior. And this is based on uh, an observation from cognitive psychology uh, that whenever humans describe a particular uh, concept, uh, they um, start by mentioning semantically uh, meaningful uh, concepts at first, and then um, the, the terms mentioned are increasing, increasingly less relevant to, to the topic. So uh, the fact that these, um, these concepts, the, the behaviors and the, and the features uh, are found uh, close uh, in the sentences, as well as the frequency of, uh, of co-occurrence uh, is, is, a, is a good indicator that there is a semantic connection between them. Uh, so we similarly link the behaviors to specific uh, malware. So we look for names of known malware families, um, as well as the term malware uh, and its synonyms. And whenever we find them close to uh, 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 one of these behaviors in the sentence, then we establish a link between the malware and the behavior. Uh, and then this indicates that the behavior is likely uh, something that that malware family uh, does. Uh, so uh, this allows us to create what is known uh, as a semantic network. Uh, in our particular semantic network here uh, has only three types of nodes, um, um, which are malware families and concrete features, and these are named entities that we extract from the text, uh, as well as uh, malware behaviors, which we extract in an open-ended fashion. And the edges between these nodes uh, connect semantically uh, related concepts, uh, and we also derive weights uh, uh, for these edges based on distance and uh, frequency of co-occurrence. So this is a fragment uh, of our actual semantic network, so you can see the three types of nodes, the malware nodes, the behavior nodes, and the feature nodes. Uh, and then uh, uh, the edges um, that, the link, that, that link these, uh, uh, these, uh, these nodes. Uh, and uh, another thing that we can do is, uh, you know, starting from the, uh, the malware nodes, um, uh, we propagate uh, the weight uh, to the behavior and then to the, uh, to the feature nodes and, you know, the, the resulting um, uh, the resulting uh, weights on, on the features after this, this weight propagation uh, indicate uh, how relevant um, the features are for, for malware detection. So note that in this example, there are some features that are, do not, are not connected to, to malware at all. So we consider that these are probably not relevant uh, for, for malware detection. Uh, and at the same time, like I said, the, 
the final weights uh, on the on the feature nodes uh, allow us to to rank them uh, and to uh, to determine which ones are are likely to be uh, relevant for malware detection uh, based on um, uh, based on the, the literature that we analyze. So uh, we have built a system called FeatureSmith um, using these techniques. Uh, and the next question is, how well does this work? So um, to answer this question, we designed an experiment uh, where we compare uh, this automatic feature engineering approach uh, as, um, as implemented in FeatureSmith uh, with um, a uh, manually engineered feature set uh, from Drebin, which is a state-of-the-art malware detector. So FeatureSmith analyzed, with, we analyzed uh, a little over 1,000 security papers, and uh, we automatically engineered uh, 195 uh, features that uh, that appear to be relevant to, to Android malware. Uh, now, in contrast, Drebin um, uses um, a very large feature space, over 500,000 features, including 315 uh, suspicious API calls. And now, these API calls were manually curated, so out of the uh, more than 20,000 um, uh, API calls from from the the Android API, um, these uh, the, the uh, Drebin creators consider that these 315 are, are look suspicious and, and you know are probably useful for malware detection. So uh, in uh, in um, in this experiment, uh, what we wanted to compare is. Uh, not the systems, but the, the features. So we um, we use the same corpus of benign and malicious apps. Uh, we train uh, the same classification algorithm. In in, in both cases, we, we use uh, we use decision trees. Uh, I'm sorry, we use uh, random forests, uh, as well as the same feature types. We use three types of features: Android API calls, Android permissions, and Android intents. Uh, and the goal here, uh, like I said, is to, compare, is to compare the two feature sets, the, the, the features that were automatically engineered by FeatureSmith and the, the, the manually engineered features from, from Dragon. Um, so the first observation is that FeatureSmith discovered some new features, um, uh, including the get sim operator name, get network operator name, get country. Uh, all these features were actually missing from the manually engineered uh, uh, set, despite the fact that it's such a such a large uh, feature set. Um, and uh, these actually helped us detect uh, one malware family called Gatosin, which uh, is uh, highlighted in the Drebin paper as um, as a false negative. Uh, so Drebin cannot detect it. Uh, however, by uh, by using these additional features that were discovered by by FeatureSmith. In the literature, uh, we are able to detect this uh, uh, this, this, this family, um, and this um, highlights this point that I was making earlier that human data scientists uh, have a hard time assimilating all the relevant knowledge. So, therefore, manually engineered feature sets um, um, are, are are likely to be incomplete. So, now to look at the overall detection performance, uh, I'm going to present a comparison using uh, this, this, this plot called the uh, uh, receiver operating uh, characteristic or ROC plot. Uh, this shows the, uh, the trade-off between the false positive rate showed on the x-axis and the true positive rate showed on the y-axis. Uh, so the ideal data point, the, the ideal um, uh, operating point uh, for a malware detector is the top left corner. Uh, which corresponds to zero false positives and 100% true positives. So this is what Drebin looks like. So this is the state-of-the-art state, state of the art Android malware detector. Uh, it has a pretty good performance. Uh, and uh, now if we compare uh, FeatureSmith, which uses these automatically engineered features, uh, the performance is almost the same. And in fact, if we look at the, the 1%, uh, false positive point on the ROC curve. Uh, this is the point that it, that is often um, uh, reported in uh, in security papers. Um, it, they actually have this, the same performance of ninety two point five percent true positives. So the performance is on par. Another thing that uh, 
we uh, we tried just for fun uh, was to see uh, if we look at papers published in different different years, uh, how much uh, how much more useful the information published in latter years uh, is compared to the, the the older information. So um, the 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 four uh, curves that you see here in this plot uh, correspond to features. Uh, uh, extracted from papers published before 2012, uh, before 2013, before 2014, and before 2015, right? So, so each, uh, e e each curve includes the features published in the, in the previous years and a few more that were published in that, in that year. And we observed that, you know, between 2012 and 2013, there was a big jump in performance. Uh, and after that, we start seeing uh, diminish diminishing returns. So now, when I show this uh, plot, people usually ask me, does this mean that uh, a lot of the published research uh, is, uh, is useful, is useless, sorry. Um, and I don't think it, um, it quite shows um, uh, this, um, because in, in these experiments, uh, we used the same set of, uh, um, of malware samples. Um, so uh, this is... Uh, you know, this is the evolution of knowledge uh, relative to a problem, to a fixed problem, right? So I, I would expect that, you know, be, because the problem is fixed, as time goes on, at some point we, we reach saturation where we know most of the important stuff about that problem. Uh, but in, tr in reality, what happens is that in security we have an arms race. So uh, in, in uh, uh, malware evolves in latter years, uh, we, we start seeing new uh, malware behavior. So probably... These papers published in latter years uh, talk about these new malware behaviors, uh, but this is not not shown in the in, uh, in this plot because we uh, we compare them to a fixed uh, ground truth. Um, so before concluding, uh, I want to mention a couple of uh, alternatives to automatic feature engineering. So first of all, we could employ feature selection, which is um, which works whenever we can enumerate all the possible features in advance. So for example, uh, all the Android permissions, we know all the possible Android permissions, and then we would uh, uh, use a ground truth to compute uh, some, uh, some feature utility metrics, such as the mutual information, uh, and, and determine which ones are the most useful uh, for detecting the malware in that particular uh, ground truth. And representation learning, uh, is an approach for discovering useful features from raw data, for example, by training a neural network, again, using a, a, a given ground truth. Um, and uh, the dis disadvantages of these techniques is that they are data-driven, uh, which means that if the, um, uh, the ground truth is, you know, is biased, includes some biases, perhaps it, it, it only includes a certain type of, uh, of malicious behavior and not the other types, uh, then the malware detector or the classifier will reflect these biases. Um, in contrast, the features that we uh, discover with FeatureSmith uh, come not from a particular, uh, are, they are not data-driven. They don't come from the ground truth, but they come from, from the security literature. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, these, uh, these approaches do not uh, enable an automatic dis discovery of the threat semantics. So, um, in a nutshell, uh, this uh, FeatureSmith uh, is a, a system that I described uh, is, is an example of what I call automatic feature engineering, uh, which uh, is able to discover semantically meaningful features for a particular uh, security threat, in this case, Android malware detection. Uh, we saw that some of these features are, were missing uh, from the manually, from a very large manually curated set. And, uh, that the performance, we can get the performance to be on par with the state-of-the-art uh, malware detector. Uh, and I also want to mention that uh, while I just described uh, Android, uh, an application for, for Android malware detection here, uh, this uh, idea of automatic feature engineering has many potential applications in security, for detecting AI bots, for uh, analyzing threat intelligence, for uh, uh, for intrusion detection, et cetera, as, as well as, uh, as other, uh, other fields, such as biomedical research, for example. 
Um, we also hear a lot of uh, concerns nowadays that uh, artificial intelligence will um, yeah, will put people out of uh, uh, out of work. Um, and uh, I do not think that automatic feature engineering represents a threat to data scientists, uh, specifically because the human data scientists have uh, intuition uh, into a particular problem. This is not something that we know how to simulate yet. However, FeatureSmith, uh, they can use FeatureSmith as a tool because it allows them to reason over the entire body of knowledge. So if you are interested in, uh, in FeatureSmith, uh, you can download the paper uh, as well uh, as uh, we, we made available the semantic network and all the, um, the features that we uh, engineered automatically at uh, FeatureSmith.org. Uh, and before concluding, I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Uh, the first one is that automated systems can understand the semantics of security concepts. And the second one is that this is a powerful tool for creating attacks and uh, defenses. Thank you. All right, so um, one question is whether FeatureSmith will move on from only detecting. Yes, we. this is, this is an ongoing project in, in our group and we are exploring um, additional um, uh, additional applications of this uh, idea of uh, automatic semantic extraction from, from the literature, um, in particular for generating uh, both defenses and, and attacks, uh, and also for predicting, for example, the future evolution of, uh, uh, of the threat landscape. Um, let's see. Can uh, a second another question is can intelligent systems learn from things other than examples? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, in in this case, um, I showed an example of a system that actually learns uh, from from security papers from from natural language. Uh, so um, by combining this with a machine learning classifier we are able to synthesize uh, you know, uh, uh, a malware detector, an Android malware detector in a fully automated fashion. Um, but really, uh, the, the missing key here was, um, uh, so like I said, malware detection uh, often uses machine learning nowadays. Uh, and this is an example, this is a case where, uh, where the system learns from examples. Uh, but the missing, the missing link here was that the feature engineering step is usually done by human data scientists. Uh, so this is the part that we try to automate in this, uh, in, in this project. Um, and then uh, the third question here is who can use these intelligent systems? Uh, so I think that this is uh, something that we are just starting to, to understand. Uh, we, we apply this technique to, uh, to malware detection. Uh, however, I think that uh, there is a uh, pretty pretty broad set of possibilities. Uh, we could use it to automate the understanding uh, of, uh, of malicious behaviors, not just uh, in the fine grain in the sense of, um, of malware detection, of detecting individual behaviors of, of malware samples and network attacks, but also uh, the, the higher level, the more abstract strategies that um, uh, that underground real world attackers uh, use uh, uh, in order to uh, um, to conduct uh, malicious campaigns uh, and also potentially to to predict uh, the next steps in a in a campaign once you observe uh, the first ones uh, and also uh, we're looking into the possibility of, of generating uh, new uh, uh, new types of uh, attacks automatically. Um, uh, and uh, 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 the, another question is whether we try to apply any machine learning method other than random forest. Yes, we actually experiment with, with SVMs. Uh, the reason why we settled on random forests is, is because they are, uh, they are faster to train, but uh, really the, the machine learning classifier is really not, uh, uh, not the key here. Um, it, it's uh, uh, the, the the key uh, in, in this project was uh, was how to generate the feature set. So once we have the feature set and uh, and the ground truth, we can use any uh, uh, any any machine learning method. 
the random forests uh, work well and uh, they were fast to train and this is really the reason why why we use them in our experiments but uh, but there you know there's no fundamental reason that, that they are uh, um, that they have to be used in, in, in this project it was a pleasure giving uh, this talk uh, I included uh, my uh, contact uh, information uh, on the last slide um, and, and uh, if you have any more questions uh, please uh, send me email about this. Mm -hmm.